Good evening. My name is Robin Muir, and I would like to welcome you all to this evening's webinar, Plastics, the Big Picture, Local Insights, and What You Can Do. This program is being produced by the League of Women Voters in concert with Olympic College and will be, will be recorded for public distribution. You should be able to access the program via our website, lwv-kitsap.org, and on the Olympic College Earth Week page. Both URLs will be posted in the chat. The League of Women Voters was founded in 1920 as an outgrowth of the women's suffrage movement. Its purpose was and is to this day to educate and inform citizens so that they be so that they may more fully participate in our democracy. While originally a women's organization, the League has welcomed members of all genders since 1973. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization, but we do take positions on matters of public policy and advocate for those positions after careful study. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that today, most of us are sitting on lands that were traditionally those of the Coast Salish peoples. Please consider for a moment that native peoples that inhabited or used this place you call home. Uh, we are excited to partner with Olympic College to bring you this webinar. I'll turn the program over to Amy Lawrence now who teaches biology and environmental studies at Olympic College. Hi, thank you, Robin. Uh, it is a pleasure to join all of you this evening and to work with the League of Women Voters on this important event. Uh, this is one of a series of events that Olympic College and our Sustainability Advisory Council has um, developed for Earth Day, which is tomorrow. Uh, so we're on Wednesday of Earth Week now. Uh, we have a series of events continuing tomorrow and Friday, both Zoom, uh, virtual sessions like this on topics like sustainability at Olympic College um, and Elwha River restoration, which we work to study, um, as well as in-person nature walks at Illahee Preserve and the Rhododendron Preserve and a work party at a local park. So we have a lot of uh, interesting and different ways to get involved, but um, this is, this is a kind of the centerpiece of our work this week. Uh, I'll be sharing more about how to get involved with those at the end of the program this evening with a link and a slide for you to look at. So thank you very much. Since 1950, plastic has exploded into our lives, impacting our world in ways that are big and small. And... Big, like covering entire beaches in different parts of the world with plastic debris, and small, like this tiny blue plastic fiber that is completely blocking the digestive system of this planktonic arrowworm. Synthetic clothes and our own washing machines are the primary source of plastic fibers in the sea. And these move up the food chain and into the bodies of fish, birds, bears, and humans. Plastic is a problem outside and in. Today, we look at this problem with some very exciting speakers. Dr. Heather Trim, the Executive Director of Zero Waste Washington will give us the big picture, the current status, the large scale strategies, legislation and policies that are needed to reduce the impact of plastic in the world. Then Hans and Nicholas Shippers, two brothers from Parlay for the Ocean, who have helped more than 20,000 children and adults learn about the impact of plastic on our oceans and inspired them to take local action in communities up and down the West Coast. Finally, I am Lori Clotier, Chair of the Paulsbo Rotary Trash Talk Task Force, and I will be sharing hyper-local resources to help us recycle right when we must. I'm excited to be introducing our first speaker, Dr. Heather Trim, Executive Director of Zero Waste Washington. Heather has more than 25 years of experience in environmental work ranging from zero waste to toxic chemicals and habitat issues. At Zero Waste Washington, her focus has been on reducing upstream sources of waste and addressing downstream impacts, getting toxic chemicals out of products, eliminating plastic pollution, and building on the organization's signature producer responsibility policy initiatives. 
Previously at FutureWise, she worked to prevent runoff from entering our waterways and improve shoreline management practices and policies. Heather was at People for Puget Sound for over 10 years where she focused on protections for the marine environment. Earlier, she was staff scientist for the Los Angeles and San Gabriel Rivers Watershed Council and worked for the Los Angeles Regional Water Quality Control Board on water quality standards, regulatory permits, pollution assessments, and greening the LA rivers and habitat removal. Let's get the information on the big picture. Wave your hands in front of your cameras and let's welcome Dr. Heather Trim. Thank you, that was wonderful. Um, let's see, let's make sure this is working. Is that showing up okay? Great, okay, good. Um, so good evening, everyone. Very, very happy to be here. And what isn't in my bio, but I probably should have put is I am a very proud member of the League of Women Voters and have been for many, many years. So um, to introduce our organization, we are a statewide nonprofit, Zero Waste Washington. Our goal is to make trash obsolete. And we have three main strategies. We primarily work to try to get laws passed at the city, the county, and the state level, as well as now a little bit at the federal level. We do research projects and we do community-based pilot projects. We have seven focus areas. I'm not gonna go into detail about all of these tonight, but I'm gonna be primarily talking about the plastic pollution and the recycling components. But I wanna draw your attention to the top left-hand corner. That is producer responsibility. So our organization, before I joined it, was the lead about 11 years ago, and I'm sure the League of Women Voters helped with this bill, to um, get a very strong e-waste, electronic waste bill passed in Washington. So that if you have a leftover computer or um, TV monitor, you can take it into places like Goodwill, and the end of life of that item is paid for by the computer industry, like by Dell and Microsoft and Apple, et cetera. And, um, a couple of years ago, and I know the league helped with this big time, a very significant bill was passed, um, the Secure Drug Take Back Act, um, which was championed by Representative Strom Peterson. It took 10 years, hundreds of people, and it did involve going county by county. Kitsap County was one of the first counties that did do this, but then we got to the state level. It was the first in the nation. And now California, um, Oregon, and and uh, New York have passed similar bills. And the very cool thing is that this program was implemented, went into effect in November, even in the pandemic. So you can go to MedPro and look for locations near you to take your leftover medicine um, from, your, from your medicine cabinet. So this would be pharmacies, the sheriff's offices and uh, hospitals. So um, check online and you can take back your leftover medicines now to be disposed of paid for by the pharmaceutical industry. Another law that was passed a couple years ago, again with hundreds of partners, a lot of cities and counties working on this, and um, likely the League of Women Voters playing a major role also in getting this passed several years ago, also led by Strom Peterson, is a paint stewardship bill that went into effect a few days ago, April 1. So you can take your leftover paint to um, again, look online, it's called Paint Care, and you can take your leftover paint. Latex paint is very, very recyclable. They make it into new um, latex paint. Um, they have computers to make sure it's the same blue, the same gray, the same beige again and again. Um, and it's half the price. So you can go to Habitat for Humanity and places like that and get it for 16 to $18 a gallon versus you know brand new latex paint, which is double that. Um, this is um, called Paint Care, and, um, and oil-based paints, by the way, are not recyclable. They're considered hazardous materials, but if they're in good shape, they'll put them up on the shelf and people can use them up for free. So that the, the goal is to get things used up. So that was a diversion, a little advertisement on producer responsibility bills that have gone into effect lately. I'm going to be talking now about the plastics and recycling crisis. Then I will talk about legislative action, which of course the league has been a major help on and other solutions. So let's start with plastics. So this is from the United Nations. And this is stats based on the current amount of plastic that is going into our waterways around the entire world. That by 2025, which is just around the corner, 
we will have one pound of plastic for every three pounds of fish biomass in our oceans. This is shocking. And this is really one of the main takeaways. We are really putting plastic into our oceans at a very, very um, uh, crazy and scary rate. So as you all know, we kind of live in a plastics era. This is a, gra a graph showing from 1950 to 2015, the global production and use of plastic by sector. So the green is building and construction. And I lived in Southern California for a number of years. And the firefighters down there are very concerned because when homes burn, like when they have those big wildfires going through and those kind of newer homes are burning in those areas, that are, they are made of a lot of plastic. And um, when they burn, the toxic chemicals coming off um, are very, um, very bad. And they have certain cancers that are showing up as clusters in their industry. They've become very aware, the firefighting industry, about this. The blue at the bottom, that is packaging. And by the way, on this graph, note the recession shows up 2007 in the graph because, because it basically impacted all the plastic use around the world. And when they pull this graph out past 2020, I'm sure we'll see some interesting curves from the use of plastic, some going up and some going down actually. So the blue at the bottom was packaging that over 30%, between 30 and 40% of the plastic resin in the world is used for packaging. That is everything from bags, bottles like you see here, the wrap around your candy bar, the wrap around your toilet paper, um, and then things like um, the little veggie sticker. All of that is defined as packaging. It's a very, very broad term, but it reflects all the things that you use for just a few minutes. You use it temporarily and then you um, dispose of it. It's not things and like durable things like your glasses or furniture, which you know, really um, you, you use for a long, long time and it's not something that we are trying to tackle. We're trying to tackle packaging and plastic single use pack packaging primarily. So I'm not going to do a lot of slides about the plastic impact and wildlife because you've seen um, many, many really great movies, a lot of media about this, but just quickly to summarize, we are now finding microplastics. So when the plastics break down into little, little bits in the ocean, um, we're finding that every, everywhere, all the way um, to the deepest point, which is the Marianas Trench. In fact, um, last year they found an entire bag, a plastic bag, all intact in the Marianas Trench. And at the poles, we are finding plastic marine debris impacting over 650 marine species. And of course, the plastics themselves are made of toxic chemicals. They're made of oil and gas and they um, are bioaccumulating um, in the wildlife food chain. Another, so that was sort of the wildlife impact. So other impacts of plastics are, um, this is one, the impact on our commercial composting. So we are an agriculture state. It is really important for us to, to create compost from your yard waste, your food waste, et cetera. But the problem for these facilities is that they get an awful lot of plastic coming in the door. So this photo at the top, is when the material is coming in, it gets dumped in a shed at these facilities. And then here's an example of one facility where it goes into windrows, um, these long rows. They let it sit for 90 days, they pump air into it, and then they flip it and let it go for another 90 days. And it makes this luscious, luscious compost. That bottom photo is a photo I took early in the morning. So you can see the steam rising off the compost, but that very pile, this is a close up of that pile. And this is what it's full of. It is full of plastic. They try to blow it out, but they really can't get it very well. The problem is, is that people think that the bags um, are pulled out. They're not pulled out very well, or they're confused about what they can and can't put. And they, they think that some things compost, which really do not compost. So one of the number one problem for our, comp, our commercial compost in this state is the um, plastic contamination. Another issue, which you all are very keenly aware of, is just the incredible amount of litter that we now have in along our waterways, in our parks, along the highways. And in the 20 years that I've lived here, I have seen an incredible increase. I think it's due to two things. One is that um, you know we have more people, so we have more litter. Two is that the type of material has really changed. We used to get coffee in a metal tin, now it's in a plastic pouch. We used to get baby food in glass jars. Now it's in plastic pouch. If you go to the grocery store and you look around, you will see that 
almost everything now is in plastic. All the fast foods in plastic. So we just have so much plastic in our lives. And that litter um, is plastic, which won't break down. It breaks into pieces, but it won't break down. So that is contributing to this problem. And then related to that is that we have spent hundreds of millions of dollars to try to restore salmon here in the Pacific Northwest. And we put in um, green infrastructure, um, drainages, et cetera. And the problem is, is those are clogging and it costs the local jurisdictions a lot of money to go in to clean out all the litter now that they didn't used to have to deal with. This is um, related to you know, flooding, re related to your home. And also, um, um, hang on one second, um, uh, uh, related to um, uh, the, 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 the features not functioning correctly. So if they're not functioning, they don't drain, they aren't gonna drain properly, then that causes problems for the salmon habitat. So um, that was the plastics problem. Now let's talk about the recycling challenge. So what, hap what happened a few years ago is China said, stop, no more. We are no longer gonna take the wastes of the world. This was called China National Sword. And they then have now renamed it China Blue Sky. What was happening was up to 60% of the waste, and that means things like um, our scraps, our, our bales of recyclable materials, et cetera, were going to China um, in the Pacific Northwest. And really all around the world, people were sending their recyclables and scrap to China. And the reason that it was happening so much here is because we are a deadhead situation, which is that we have container ships coming from um, China and Southeast Asia full of goods and they're offloaded and they're either put on rail and go into the Midwest to China or they are sold here. But they were coming in full of lots of goodies, lots of stuff. And they were going home empty, mostly empty. And so it became really a good deal to put your, what, your recyclables and your scrap into the container ships and send them to China. The, um, it was cheaper to send a bale to China by ship from Seattle than to go from Seattle to Portland, Oregon by truck. That is the dynamic. And that's kind of a shocking dynamic if you think about it, because you think about the greenhouse gases and you think about what it really should cost to do that. So it was going to China and China basically um, was, they basically said, no, no more. There were 24 different commodities and they said that the standard was gonna have to be 0.03% contamination in the bale. They upped it to 0.05, that is not a typo. That is not, that is less than 1% contamination in a bale. And our rates of contamination were nine to 11%. So this is really, really different. Our, they, they said one, less than one, and our contamination was nine to 11%, oh, I'm sorry, wait, I mis said that. 11 to 20% contamination, meaning that if you had a bale of plastic water bottles um, or plastic bottles, it might have um, metal or glass or the wrong plastics or food waste um, or paper in there, 20 up 11 to 20% of that. So, they, so this is two inspectors on the dock in China and they are um, pulling the bales off, cutting them open and looking to see if there was any contamination. And if they, see, if they saw anything, they would basically say reject and the entire container load and all the other containers with it would be sent back to wherever it came from. That's how strict they got. It used to be that they would send, they would say, come on in. So there's this movie that is a really terrific movie. You can watch the three minute trailer online called Plastic China and you will see what was happening. All of our material was going into China. Some was going to factories, but much of it was going to little mom and pop operations all over China where they would pull out what they could. They'd open up the bale and they, they would take the stuff they could sell, but all that contamination was going in, was either being dumped or burned. And it was a huge, huge environmental nightmare for them, um, especially from the point of view of air pollution and human health. So this is, so they renamed the initiative Light Blue Sky. And here is what the situation is and was in China. This is um, from 2015. This is the view from CNN Tower in Beijing, looking over the city. And you can see that during a military parade, the sky was blue 
And then three days later, it was back to normal because they let, they had stopped the industry from doing any operations for three days. And you may recall from the Olympics, they did the same thing for many, many months. So what they want to do in China is they want to get a clean environment and they want to do their own circular economy. So we think this is a really, really good thing that they've done. But it has caused a recycling crisis here that we are now reckoning with, which is a good thing also. So um, here is an image of a MRF, a material recovery facility when, where, the, where your recyclables go in and they get dumped on a conveyor belt and then they go through a bunch of um, different things to sort everything. They use um, gravity, they use air, they use magnets, they use optical um, computers, lasers to sort everything into different bales. And by the way, we do an annual tour of MRF. So if you want to sign up for one of our tours, obviously with the pandemic, we're not, but we will get back to it as soon as the pandemic's over. It is really interesting to go and look at um, a MRF, do a tour. So um, the thing is, though, that the MRFs, the material recovery facilities, are designed mainly to separate flat things like paper and cardboard from round things like bottles and jugs. And um, that's kind of the fundamental principle within the facility. And what we have done though, and this is also kind of a good thing, is when the trucks are coming around to pick up your recyclables, they then periodically crush everything and they are trying to get as much stuff in the truck. They get 30% more material in the truck if they crush everything. But what that does is it makes all the, the plastic go flat and it breaks the glass. Um, so it causes all these problems. So this is a bale, and I know it doesn't look much like a bale, it's no longer cube shape, but this was from a photos that I took when I was touring a pulp and paper um, facility in Spokane. And um, this was a, um, uh, this supposed to be mixed paper. And so you can see that from this view right now, it looks like paper. Here is an up close photo. See the plastic lid and other plastic in there, the plastic uh, dairy lid. And then here's another up close photo. And in the middle here is a um, vertical image of a plastic bag. This bale of paper, mixed paper, was full of plastic once you looked at it closely. That's the problem. All these plastics get flattened or they behave flatly. They behave like a flat thing in the MRF and they become like paper and they could cause that contamination for the paper and, and other materials as well. So like I said, we've had a recycling crisis going on for several years due to the um, China saying no and us having to reckon with our own stuff. And um, people say, but what's holding value? So what actually did okay through this was glass. We have a glass um, facility here in, south, south, in, in Washington in South Seattle um, that makes new glass wine bottles from recycled glass, aluminum cans, um, and the number one and number two um, bottles have done pretty well. But paper, which was the economic driver for recycling and the largest volume of the material in the recycling facilities, went from over $100 a ton in value. And then when China soared happened, they went, it first went down to like $30 a ton, and then it went down eventually to minus $30 a ton, minus $30 a ton, because um, it was basically, they would have to, they were, they were paying for the shipping to get it to the pulp and paper mills. That's what happened. That's the dynamic. Now, paper has rebounded a bit, and things do go up and down a bit, so things are a little better now than they were, but that caused a huge um challenge for the recycling facilities because that was kind of their economic driver was the paper and these other things as well. Now people say, why do you really care about recycling? Should we really be recycling? And the answer is yes, recycling is good for many, many reasons. If, by the way, our number one thing is reduce the waste in the first place. But if you have material that you do need to recycle, it is really great to recycle it um, for many reasons. But one of the big ones is energy. This show, this is a relatively new, I think it's 2019 or 2018 data from um, ISRI, which does a, they do a great job of, of tracking this. This is showing the value um, from an um, energy saving perspective of um, recycling various things. And you can see that you are, you probably already knew that aluminum cans were really good to do. Um, that it's bauxite, uh, mining bauxite is extraordinarily energy intensive and also very environmentally damaging um, to make the aluminum in the first place. 
Now look at how good plastic is though relatively. Plastic is a really good thing from an energy perspective to recycle. Now I wanna conclude this section of the talk by talking about this really terrific report that was done by As You Sew in 2020. And um, what's cool about this is they looked at the um, 50 major international corporations on their plastic packaging pollution. And they looked at six things. They looked at their packaging design, how reusable they made things, their recycled content, um, the transparency, uh, how much they support recycling and their producer responsibility elements. And here is the report card and it ain't a great report card. Looky here, only one company got a B minus, no A's in this crowd. Unilever got a B minus. And then a bunch of companies got C plus or C's. And then a lot of companies got D's or F's. This is the problem we have. We need to really get the major manufacturers, the major companies to really um, step it up on, on addressing this plastic pollution issue. Okay, now I'm gonna turn, and we do have lots of times for Q&A at the end. I, I normally take questions during, but today I'm gonna, they're gonna be at the end. I'm gonna turn to legislative action. So we have, we're just winding down. This is the last week of the legislative session as I'm sure you all are keenly aware. And we did in fact have quite a few zero waste related bills and six have made it through and are on their way. I think all of these are now on their way to the governor for um, his signature or have already been signed. But, um, and then we have some other ones which are getting ready to go for hopefully next year, didn't make it this year. Um, and I can see I have a formatting issue there. Sorry about that. So um, let's start with the main, and I'm really, cause tonight's about plastics. I'm gonna focus on this bill. So we view that there are two main ways to solve our plastic and recycling crisis from a policy perspective. One is reduce the use of unnecessary plastics in the first place. Bring your own bag, bring your own thermos. Then secondly, build markets and restore our recycling system, creating jobs in Washington. And we have a coalition of, of environmental groups, you can see them along the bottom, who are helping lead a plastic-free Washington coalition working on this, this strategy. And of course, the League of Women Voters played a major role this year as they have in the past as well. So the big bill, which um, got concurred um, in the Senate back on Monday and is now on its way to the governor for, I guess they have, they have the, the president signed, but the speaker hasn't signed. This is about to go to the governor to get signed. So this is a bill that was, that was um, sponsored by Senator Mona Das, who's on the left-hand side here, who is from Kent and then was championed in the house by Liz Re um, Berry, who is from the Seattle area. And it has three major components, very exciting. So the first one is banding expanded polystyrene or styrofoam, um, food service products, which you can see on the left, coolers and packing peanuts. Now um, this bill, if it gets signed by the governor, will be, um, we will be the sixth state, that's six state, we will be the sixth state to pass a styrofoam um, law for our entire state and we're the first state to include the coolers. So that's exciting. Um, the second component of the bill is to, that when you go to get takeout food, um, the, the restaurant or the delivery service has to ask you and get your confirmation that you want utensils and utensils includes um, splash sticks, which are there on the bottom or chopsticks, anything that gets food from your um, food item to your mouth, straws, cup lids, cold cup lids, and condiment packages. And um, this is super exciting because this is the first in the nation. Woo! Um, we, there's um, five states, I think, that have done straws, but we are the first in the nation to do this. And DoorDash is going to be included. So DoorDash and Grubhub and all those third-party delivery services have, um, they, they're gonna be included. Um, all, many of them have already converted to this across the US. DoorDash was holding out, but now DoorDash will have to do it in Washington state. My guess is they'll probably just go ahead and do it for the whole US. So this is very exciting. Very good way to reduce the plastic in the first place. Um, Cause that, like me, I'm sure you all have a drawer full of plastic forks at home. The last component of the bill is um, minimum recycled content for different things. So this first one is for plastic beverage containers. 
it is saying that by 2031, the um, major manufacturers of, of, um, of beverages, that's everything from water to soda, et cetera, have to have 50% um, recycled content, not, and, and that, that's displacing essentially virgin, virgin oil and gas. Now, the major manufacturers have already made big pledges. So like Coke and Pepsi and Nestle have already made big pledges and Naked is already doing 100% recycled content in their bottles. Now, the next piece, and by the way, so this one is this bill, this component of the bill, um, we're second. California passed this in August, but we go a little further. We include dairy milk and alcohol. Um, now, this is the first in the nation, so super exciting, and in fact, I think first in the world, honestly. Um, it is requiring recycled content in um, household cleaning products and personal care products. So this is things like laundry detergent and cleaning um, sprays and things like that, and then shampoos and conditioners and lotions. This is for eight ounce bottles and jugs. A bottle and jug is defined as where the, the um, neck is narrower than the bottom of the item. So if it was, um, uh, uh, so you can see examples here. Then the next thing, the last thing is that it also requires recycled content for garbage bags. Um, so this will make it so that your, when you go put your plastic bags and wrap in the um, take back program at the grocery store, it can help go into this. And it's requiring 40% by 2027. California has a 10% standard. They've had that for years, decades. And now we're going further here in Washington. Very proud of that with all your help and all the partners help. So I'm gonna talk briefly about one other bill because it is related to plastics. And that is, even though it doesn't look like it here, um, when we all worked to get the bag bill passed last year, um, it included a recycled content mandate for the replacement of the plastic bag. So the thin plastic carry home bag is going to be banned when it gets implemented. And um, that you're gonna be allowed to bring, get a paper bag or a thicker plastic carry home bag with minimum recycled content requirements in those. Now, RepRude um, is from, um, okay, great, uh, thank you, five minutes. Terrific, okay, great. Um, RepRude, who's in, um, from Southern Washington, um, brought forward this bill. And it, at first we were like, mm, yeah, I don't know, well, that may not be such a great bill. But then we became enthusiastic supporters because um, what it, what the bill does is it says that you can use wheat straw, and that's the waste after you harvest the wheat, the wheat, um, and replacing the recycled content for the paper bags um, up to the 40%. And so um, the reason why this is a good bill is because in Washington, at the end of the season, when the wheat has already been harvested, they tend, not always, but they often burn the waste wheat, wheat straw, and that causes um, human health impacts in the community and um, the, also climate change impacts. So there's an entrepreneur in Southern Washington who's developed a way to pulp this, to turn it into pulp so it can be made into paper bags. Um, partly, you know, goes into paper bags. So this, we decided this was an okay bill and we are happy that this is happening. Now let's look forward to next year really briefly because I know I'm winding down here. Um, so we are working again with all those partners in the cities and counties and others on a big bill for next year related to um, how, do we, how do we manage the whole recycling system? Um, the model, and it may not be a pure product stewardship bill, but it, we're, looking, we're not sure how the bill is gonna actually play out, but around the world right now, and you can see in blue, different colors of blue, there are, there are producer responsibility programs in place for packaging and paper products. That is everything you're putting in your blue bin. So that's plastic, metal, glass, and paper. Um, and um, you can see that the United States is gray. We don't have any laws like that here. This is a big deal, a big heavy lift. And um, what it would do is it would have the manufacturers and the brand owners pay for a program that manages all the things in your recycle bin, the pay packaging and paper products at the end of life. Where it's the bill that we're, we're kind of working on, and again, we're gonna be doing a lot of work over the interim, is modeled more or less after the Recycle BC program up in British Columbia, where they have a recovery rate of 75% um, of their materials. So they, they do have this program there and it's got some flaws, but it's fundamentally a really cool and great program. What this does is it shifts the cost from the ratepayer to the manufacturer for the end of life of materials. 
So this is what we're working on for next year, 2022. Now, really quickly, um, what are some other solutions? So one is we work with groups, if any of you do litter cleanups, to help quantify your the litter when you do litter, litter cleanups. Right now, under the Clean Water Act, there are seven states and DC that actually look at litter as a, under, as a regulated thing under the Clean Water Act as a water quality program, as a pollutant. They're saying plastic is a pollutant. And so we will come and help support any groups that are doing litter cleanups um, with a robust um, one time, so once every couple of years, um, assessment of the litter so we can actually look at data across the state. And then um, very excitingly, um, in October, the Department of Health uh, for Washington State has changed the food code, the food safety code, so that you will be allowed legally to bring your own container for food and also bring your own container for beverages. Right now, it is actually illegal to bring your own container for food in Washington state. Um, most of the grocery stores and restaurants have kind of turned a blind eye. Of course, during pandemic, everything has been a little bit crazy, but um, this will now make it legal. It won't go into effect till March, 22nd, March 2022. And then I'm going to skip this last bit because we are, um, I'll go right to here since we're running out of time. Um, so we subscribe to uh, waste prevention and reduction as this hierarchy. First thing we want to do is prevent the plastic in the first place. Don't buy it, refuse it, um, bring your own container, bring your own bag, then reuse. Let's reuse and repair everything and make things last longer. And then recycling. We are very opposed to recovery because that's a code word for incineration and we are definitely opposed to landfilling. So I will thank you and turn it back over. Thank you so much, Heather. The plastic situation is so grim that to hear some of these advances in legislation and upcoming changes is really exciting. Thank you for this big picture view. Now we are going to be switching over and hearing a little bit more about local action from our speakers, Hans and Nicholas Shippers. They are local brothers raised in Kingston. They share a love of surfing and a heartbreak at seeing remote beaches that they loved now covered in the debris of our addiction to plastic. Hans graduated from the University of Hawaii with a BA in environmental economics and political science. Older brother Nicholas took a degree from UW in environmental studies and a master's of public administration in environmental policy. Most recently, they banded together to teach children and adults on issues of plastic pollution. And in partnership with Sustainable Coastlines Hawaii, they refurbished a school bus and educated more than 20,000 students up and down the West Coast. They've been to countless communities and numerous countries. Today, they're working with Parlay for the Oceans to help develop a youth program that uses their unique voices to inspire action and broaden their educational efforts to the world. Let's welcome two surfers with an important message, Hans and Nicholas Shippers. Cool. Well, thank you guys so much for having us. We're super stoked to get the opportunity to talk to a local group from Kitsap County where Nick and I were born and raised. Uh, and it's awesome to see the actions that are being taken uh, in our hometown. Um, Nick and I are currently working with an organization called Parlay for the Oceans and we can share our screen really quick so you guys can see this. Can everybody see this? Yes. I'm gonna take that as a yes. Looks good. Okay, so Parlay is an environmental organization. They're based out of New York uh, and it's really a space where collaborators and innovators come together to find creative solutions for our oceans. Um, and what Nick and I do for Parlay is pretty unique uh, in the sense that we are highly focused on youth education and outreach. So our story started about two, two and a half years ago uh, when we both graduated college. Nick was finishing up his master's and I was finishing my undergrad. Uh, and we both got jobs right out of college in the environmental space, but we felt compelled to do more uh, to benefit our favorite place in the, in the world, which is the oceans uh, and surfing and getting to spend all this quality time around them. So we took off with this crazy idea. We remodeled this old school bus with the help of our dad. And we set out with this goal to teach 10,000 students on the West Coast. 
Uh, and to date, we've taught just around 20,000 students about the issue of plastic pollution and the effects on marine environments. And the reason that we really focus on youth education and outreach is because we believe that youth have the power uh, to change the world. And we wanna give them the tools necessary to do that. Um, whether that be schools in Southern California that we talked to that were able to get rid of plastic utensils, uh, lunch trays in their schools, in their communities even, um, or other youth around the country that have been able to organize their communities and take action on this issue. So we really see youth as the gateway uh, to tackling these issues. Oh, there we go. Yeah, and so Hans and I, as Hans had mentioned, we've taught over 20,000 students to date and organized countless beach cleanups and community activities. So we've really pushed hard to try and focus on communities tackling this issue together. Um, and that really stems from the fact that nobody knows or understands their community better than those people who are living within that community. And we've taught, you know, in very, very wealthy communities. We've also taught in very underserved communities. And regardless of where we've been, there have always been students and individuals within those communities that are willing to stand up and take the initiative to push for change within that community. And that's really what we're trying to do and really where Hans and I try and focus on environmental issues and plastic pollution in particular is on this idea of community action and how can you come together with those in your community to move the needle forward. Um, and when we think about plastic pollution, and we'll talk about this slightly more as we dive into it, but as Heather had alluded to, this is a massive, massive issue. Um, and it is something that really, really stems from the oil industry um, and a lot of major industrial money and business money being put into this. And so to get a shift on this issue, it's going to require a lot of people standing up and saying, hey, we want to do this different. And that shift at this time is likely not gonna come from the top. It's not gonna be a top-down shift. This is something that has to occur, at least right now from the bottom. So hopefully that will change as we move forward, but this is kind of where things stand right now. Um, let me see, there we go. So. Just real quick, view from outer space, Hans and I, like Hans said, said, we work for an organization called Parlay for the Oceans. So why the oceans as opposed to the earth? Well, the oceans cover 70% of planet earth and they provide anywhere from 50 to 85% of the oxygen that we breathe. So our oceans are essential to life on earth. And what would the earth look like without our oceans? Well, it'd look pretty dead, right? So. We want to make sure that our oceans are healthy. We want to make sure that people have equitable access to the oceans. Um, and we want to make sure that when it comes to issues like plastic pollution, uh, we're tackling these, ash these issues in a way that is extremely tangible and extremely accessible for people from all different backgrounds and all different communities. So kind of diving into it here. Life has existed in the oceans for billions of years, but today they're at risk, right? So what are some of these risks? Well, there's overfishing. A uh, recent documentary called Sea Spiracy actually just came out. There is a lot of good information in that documentary. Um, it, it definitely paints the picture of the overfishing industry and kind of the problems with it pretty well. But there is also some inaccuracies in that documentary. Um, and it definitely sparked a lot of conversation in the environmental community, but I would highly recommend watching it. Maybe you just watch it with a critical eye if you get the chance. We also have climate change that is leading to warmer oceans. Uh, and one of the side effects of climate change is also higher rates of CO2, which leads to ocean acidification, which leads to the decay of coral reefs. Um, and then on top of all that, there's obviously ocean dead zones, which we all know of in Kitsap County and in the Puget Sound region because of the Hood Canal. Uh, Hood Canal is relatively well renowned for its uh, hypoxic zones and its dead zones that occur when we see large phytoplankton blooms. And these are in large part related to agricultural runoff, uh, fertilizers that contain nitrogen and phosphorus, as well as 
uh, fluids from your car, all sorts of other things can lead to these phytoplankton blooms and create massive hypoxic or low oxygen zones that are devastating. Great, there's all these ocean issues. Why talk about plastic? Well, Hans and I focus on plastic because plastic's the easiest one for people to grab onto. It's like a gateway issue for the rest of the environmental issues and the rest of the ocean issues that are out there. Everyone uses plastic and it's a great way to kind of dive headfirst into the environmental issues at large. Yeah, so to Nick's point, obviously plastic is one of the most tangible issues that anybody around the world can wrap their heads around because it's something that we interact with on a daily basis, whether it's parts of this computer that we're talking to you that are made out of plastic, uh, utensils used on a daily basis, uh, or other items that we're touching that are plastic. But this plastic pollution problem has become extremely bad over the years. This is a photo taken in Indonesia, um, and we're not gonna talk too much about the context behind that. But as we all know, and as we've seen through social media and all sorts of outlets, this issue has become extremely bad. And to Heather's point, what she was talking about was the different types of plastic that you might recycle or use. And we like to think of it as the single use plastics that you use on a day-to-day -day basis and thinking about how we can reduce uh, our use of those items, whether that be a plastic water bottle, Toothbrushes aren't single use, but it is a multi-use plastic item that ends up in our oceans. Uh, lunch trays, styrofoam lunch trays, things like that. All these items are a lot of the items that we have seen on beaches all around the world. Um, and it's something that we can all take part in in taking action. Um, a friend of ours that did a study likes to say that humans use these single use plastics for an average of 15 minutes. So if you think about the use of that item, and the effort put into it to produce it, it's not really worth the outcome of it ending up on our beaches. So definitely refuse single use plastics wherever you can. And by 2050, there might be more plastic than fish in our oceans. Just a crazy stat to think about. Yeah, and it really all ties back to, you know, where is all this plastic coming from? And we, start with the single use plastic thing just because that is what people have the most control over directly obviously this ties to plastic as a material in and of itself and plastics are you know one of the highest uh growth places for the oil industry and we could dive down an entire rabbit hole about the oil industry and how they are basically advocating and pushing extremely hard for us to think that recycling is a valid system and that it works well. Uh, as Heather was saying, we should recycle where we can, but the amount of plastic that we use and consume and produce is like astronomically higher than what we have in terms of recycling capacity, right? So uh, I believe the latest figure we've been told was that the US has invested around what is it 200 billion 200 billion 200 billion dollars into new plastics uh by 2025 and roughly only a billion point eight so less than two billion dollars into new recycling infrastructure so we're gonna have 200 parts new plastic and two parts new recycling it's just simple math that doesn't really work out i think that's pretty obvious and there's some massive issues that need to be addressed there um but the way we address those issues and this is what we want to dive into today is through community action and through speaking up and slowly building that community action and doing the hard work to bring this up to the legislature and up to the policy level like Heather was alluding to earlier. So like she had said, plastics break down and photograde into microplastics. We'll skip past that. Wait, wait, wait. Plastics break up. They break, don't break down. <laughs> break up. They don't break down. <laughs> Uh, animals ingest them, in, in particular seabirds um, are one of the worst ones that are ingesting it and we end up ingesting it, right? So there was a study put out, I believe by the World Wildlife Foundation, uh, that the average human is ingesting up to a credit card sized amount of plastic every week. And when you think about that, that's pretty scary because we do not know the all the underlying health effects that will be caused by this. and for us to go blindly for the next 60 to 80 years of our lives, pray to God, Hans and I are around that much longer, uh, without knowing 
what the heck we're ingesting and what the long-term impacts are that of that are is a pretty scary thought. And so we need to change this industry and we need to change the way that communities work to address the issue of plastic pollution. Yeah. So at Parlay, and when we think about community action at Parlay, we like to use this acronym that's called AIR. And AIR stands for avoid, intercept, and redesign. And this is really what we want to talk to you guys about today is how we can implement this strategy within our communities. So it can be as simple as we think about single use plastics as avoiding, or as Heather was saying, refusing single use plastics and taking that individual action. Nick and I always say that individual action affected upon millions equals results. It really does add up for you to take individual action and lead by example, whether it's with your friends, your family, or within your community. Um, but taking that a step further, how else can you avoid single use plastic, right? We don't all have the luxury to bring a reusable item uh, to the bulk store and fill it up with food. So, or even to have a reusable water bottle. Nick and I talked to a school in Oregon that wrote a grant to Hydro Flask uh, and to get reusable water bottles because they couldn't afford them. So how can we make these reusable items that be the claim to refusing single use plastic easy? So as we were saying, intercept is the next part in the AIR strategy that stands for the I. And what that means is to think about ways in our community and Heather alluded to this earlier, um, but local action and local beach cleanups are an incredibly important way to start thinking about this plastic pollution problem and it's not just about picking up trash uh, and thinking that we did our part it's about connecting community 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 is such a missing link today to solving any issue whether that be environmental political or social we're so disconnected from our communities around the world and caught up in our own streams of media um, our faces are in our phones. We have so much going on. It's hard to think about uh, even taking the time to interact with your community, but beach cleanups can provide that service. Um, whether it's two hours that your community comes together, gets out, cleans the beach, you see what type of plastic are ending up on our beaches, um, free foods donated, live music, making it fun and about families coming out and taking care of the place uh, that they get to call home. That's an incredibly important way uh, to think about solving this issue. Yeah. And then taking it a step further, what are big term solutions to intercepting plastic from our waterways? What are some upstream solutions, whether those are catchment systems that fall upstream to stop these debris from ever entering our oceans to begin with? So it gives a little stop motion. This was out in Hawaii on the east side of Oahu where Sustainable Coastlines Hawaii, a group hosts some of the biggest beach cleanups in the world. They get hundreds of people together, which is tough right now with COVID obviously, but it makes it an incredibly fun and interactive experience for the community. And the last phase in the air strategy is redesign. And that really encourages uh, communities to think about how do we redesign not only the material but the system at whole right so what are ways that we can get the community involved to speak up and express that not only are they aware of this issue now not only are they connected to it and feel a sense of responsibility for the issue but how do we get these communities to take ownership for the issue so within kids app county there's a lot of different ways this could unfold but really, it, it comes down to the people that are living there, which unfortunately is not Hans and I at this time. We will be back, though, and we will be doing something very soon in the future, I'm sure. Um, but who's there right now that can be on the ground every day helping to push for change, whether it's sitting in front of Albertsons on the corner of Hansville Highway, where Hans and I grew up going to the grocery store and saying, hey, we're going to get rid of plastic bags. Here's how we're going to do it. Um, it's so many little actions and all it takes is one person standing up and getting their friends to be like, yeah, I kind of want to do that too. You know, how do you make community garden school? How do you make uh, school garden school and getting rid of plastic and styrofoam lunch trays within schools? Uh, these are all steps forward that make a massive difference yeah. 
um, and reflect well, not only on the community, but they have an effect on the communities adjacent to that community. And not only that, thinking about legislative action, how can we get our youth involved in that process? I, I really think that that moves the needle forward so much more than just the same voices showing up. And we saw that here uh, when I was in school at the University of Hawaii, Bill 40 that got passed at a state level. One of the only reasons it was passed is because we had high schoolers and middle schoolers show up from all over the island to the state legislator and make their voice heard. And it scared the shit out of the politicians. It was an awesome way to move the needle forward on solving these issues. Yeah. And then the last piece of redesign, this is our buddy Taylor who runs an organization called the Cigarette Surfboard is and what he does basically is he turns cigarette butts into new surfboards and he uses those surfboards as a communication piece, right? So this bridges the gap for people that wouldn't necessarily want to talk about this issue in the first place. And it has them, a lot of people have also come up to Taylor and been like, hey, what is that thing? What are you holding in your hands there? And the next thing you know, they're talking about the surfboard or maybe fellow surfers that might also be smokers. They do go hand in hand, unfortunately, sometimes. What are you guys doing there? What is this surfboard? And the next thing you know, they're talking about the problem of cigarette litter and how that issue can be addressed. Um, cigarette butts, for you, those of you that don't know, they're the most littered item in the world and they are made of plastic. Um, over, I forget the number, it's like over 5 trillion cigarette butts get littered each year. So that's a really easy gateway to start. But thinking about art and different ways to engage with this issue is incredibly important to bringing the community to the table to learn about it and to be less abrasive towards the, oh, I'm not a smoker or, oh, that's not my problem kind of mentality. We really want to be able to bridge that gap and bring them into the conversation, call them into the solutions rather than calling them out. So that is kind of what we have for you guys today. I'm so sorry we're running short on time and we will have to jump. Um, but if you do have questions, please email them to Hans at parlay.tv or Nicholas at parlay.tv. Uh, and we would love to read those questions and get back to you. Um, we're currently in Oahu, in Hawaii, building this community center to educate the public here about ocean issues. So our work never stops literally on the job site right now painting. So we have to get back to work. <laughs> But thank you so much for having us today. Thank you so much, Nicholas and Hans, and good luck on your building project. We really appreciate you ha having you here. Uh, fantastic uh, actions that we can look forward to taking to move forward on plastic solutions. Thank you again. Thank, thank you, you guys. guys. Aloha. So we're going to move on to recycling. And after hearing from Heather and from Hans and Nicholas, it's pretty apparent that recycling is not going to be our primary way of dealing with uh, the plastic problem. But what we want to do today is learn how to do it fast, learn how to do it right and have enough energy left over to move forward on more significant actions. So let's take a look at four types of recycling that we can do in Kitsap County. Our curbside and transfer stations, our retail take back programs, special events and programs, and pay to recycle. The, the most important important thing we need to know about curbside recycling is what, where does our stuff go when it leaves our home? And as Heather told us, it goes to the MRF. Our MRF is JMK Fibers in Tacoma. Hundreds of trucks unload and the volume is enormous. So clearly sorting this volume of stuff is the key. Um, if plastic can't be sorted, it can't be used, it can't be sold, and it can actually contaminate contaminate other recyclables. Heather showed us some of the high tech uh, magnets, air blowers, optical scanners, and also the low tech where human eyes and hands help in the sorting. But if we foul things up, 
by putting the wrong things in our recycle bin, we really throw a monkey wrench in it. Here we see people removing plastic bags that got improperly put into curbside recycling from the sorting material using their Sawzall. So how do you keep from doing harm when you just want to be a good recycler? And part of it is to remember that curbside recycling is very local. MRFs and small recyclers have different sorting equipment and different markets to sell to. So when you see a headline in Portland saying that they're no longer taking paper, or you have a sister-in-law in Texas who has a whole lot to say about your yogurt cups, um, these things may not have anything to do with the MRF that we work with here in, uh, in Tacoma. So there are four rules that can keep you from causing harm and let you recycle quickly and efficiently. Oops. Empty, clean, and dry. All recycling must be these things. Uh, how, how clean? There should be no food residue. How dry? Shake the water out. And the second rule, avoid wish cycling. What is wish cycling? Well, that's when you really, really, really don't want to throw something into landfill. So you think, well, maybe somebody can do something with this. Here's an example of wish cycling. This big plastic bag, oh, it's hard to see it, huh? It's a little, it has plastic zippers, cloth, various kinds of plastic. It just seems a shame to be putting that into landfill. But to put it into recycling, it's just going to end up in, in, in landfill anyway, slow down their process, make it less efficient, make it harder to compete with virgin uh, plastics when they're going to market and trying to sell their plastics. So wish cycling is something that we just need to not do. I'd like to take a little poll. Now, in front of you, you should see uh, I have been guilty of wishful recycling. Now, please be honest, press true or false. And um, in just a minute here, we'll, we'll uh, get our results. Give you five more seconds. So Robin, how do we do? Okay, obviously wish cycling is very common. 80% of us have done it. And I completely understand. Now, don't ever do it again. If you are in doubt about something, throw it out. And you know, it would be really cool if we could just have some kind of illustrated guide that could tell us exactly what can be recycled and what can't. Oh, wait a minute. We do have such a guide. It's produced your guide to curbside recycle by Kitsap County. And I love this guide. Let's take a look at what it has inside. It very clearly shows what can be recycled for plastic. It is jugs, bottles, jars, and dairy tubs. Those are four shapes that can move through the recycling facility and be sorted properly and not cause trouble. And when you look at this little guide, you can see that there are caps on the jugs and the jars and the bottles. Um, because they have a screw on, that cap works. It won't uh, get detached, get stuck into some other um, stream of recycling. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, wait a minute, where are the little triangles and the little numbers that tell us what we should recycle? And I'd like to unpack that for just a second. Look at these coffee cup lids. They think they are as sweet and innocent as a little kitten. They've got their cute little triangles. They've got their fancy schmancy numbers on them. And while I'm not saying they're lying, they are definitely deceptive. It can't be recycled here in JMK fibers or in any MRF that I have heard. They're too small. They fly up in the air. They can contaminate the paper bales, as we saw in Heather's slides. So this deception is by design, and we can end up doing harm when we really want to help. So stick to the guide 
And just remember, as much as we may wish to recycle other shapes, right here in Kitsap County, it's bottles, jugs, jars, and round dairy tubs. Now, um, this guide makes it easy, but when if you print it out and you put it on your desk or you put it in your file, it's not going to be where you need it when you're making decisions. And when you're making recycling decisions, when you're tired, when decision fatigue has, uh, has arrived, it's easy to make mistakes. So rule number three is print the uh, flyer and post it in a place where you're gonna be doing your recycling. I tape mine to the inside of my recycle bin lid. Um, people have put them inside their cupboard doors Printing and posting, let me reiterate just how important that is. We want to print, then post. It's just as sexy as the bend and snap. And when done properly, has a 98% chance of reducing our wish cycling. In addition to our curbside recycling, You've probably seen some take back programs in your grocery store. It's probably the most common one. You'll see bins where they take back grocery bags. Um, but they can take a whole lot more than just grocery bags. Some of the most surprising ones for people that I've talked to are the bubble wrap can be put in those bins. And so can uh, plastic shipping envelopes. Um, what the grocery stores do with this is they it goes back to their distribution centers in the empty trucks that are leaving after they've dropped off all of the um, products. They bail it and they sell it. And one company that they sell to is Trex. It's um, it's pretty wonderful the number of things that don't have to go into landfill that can't go into curbside but can be used to, to make decking materials, furniture, and railings. I chose Trex because they are particularly uh, giving back to the community. If you're a community group that collects 500 pounds of plastic wrap, they will award you with a high quality composite lumber uh, bench for your community or school. Uh, Paulsbo Rotary has collected 20,000 pounds of plastic film that has stayed out of landfill and is going back into the economy. So before we go into special events and programs, it's time to take a little quiz and consolidate some of the information that we have learned. Robin, let's quiz us. What do you do with a plastic clamshell container? That's the kind of container that looks like this. It's a plastic box with an attached lid. We have fruit that comes in it. Um, all kinds of different things now arrive to us in plastic clamshells. So what do you do it? Put it in your curbside recycle bin, landfill, throw it out or reuse as a container save them up and take to a transfer station, remove the label, make sure it is clean and dry and recycle it. Let's give you five more seconds. And Robin, let's see what our results are. Put it in your curbside recycle bin. Well, we can't do that because it's not on that guide. Um, landfill, 89% of you said to throw it out or reuse it as a container. You are absolutely right. Remove the label, make sure it is clean and dry and recycle it. I tricked you there by putting clean and dry in, but for clamshells, they cannot be sorted at the MRF. Uh, tracks and grocery stores don't want them back. It is a very difficult thing to um, to avoid, but it can be done. Let's go to our next question. What do you do with a plastic mailer? Put it in your curbside recycle bin, landfill, throw it out, 
take it to a plastic bag collection bin at a grocery store. And let's see our results. Okay, you guys are a great group. 90% chose the right answer, which is take it to a plastic bag collection bin at a grocery store. Um, one thing that you cannot take, and we can go ahead and close that, Robin. One thing that we cannot take to that bin is when you get one of those paper envelopes that is that has bubble wrap on the inside. Because that is a mix of both paper and plastic, the plastic would contaminate the paper and the paper would contaminate the plastic. And these are the most difficult kinds of things and they have to go to landfill. So let's go on to special events and collections. We've got two great special events coming up. Both of them have to do with styrofoam. So the Kitsap County is doing a styrofoam roundup, as is Bainbridge Zero Waste doing styrofoam and CD DVD collection. You can see the dates here and on that resource, um, I, I, will, I will have um, a link so that you can go to a resource uh, link farm and easily click to find events that are going on throughout the county. Now styrofoam is really evil and it can't be compressed so it fills up landfills quickly. We can't send it to curbside recycling, but we can store it. And I've had people say, well, I am in a tiny, tiny place. I don't have room to store it. But under beds, behind couches, we can get pretty creative when we need to. And um, just a couple tricks about knowing what really is styrofoam. Styrofoam is snappable. It's stiff, um, it often has little, little beads if you scratch it. Many of our food trays are snappable and what it is not, and what I see a lot of when we help people to collect is this soft foam that's very bendy. Also foam like this, people will bring in Styrofoam, like all other kinds of recycling, needs to be empty, clean, and dry. And I hope that you will consider saving your styrofoam and bringing it to uh, Safeway in Port Orchard or Bay Hay and Feed at these dates coming up in, um, in, in June. Oh, one last thing on the styrofoam. The biggest contamination that we see is leaving on the tape and the label. So please be sure to take those off. Finally, the fourth type of recycling we can do is pay for recycling. TerraCycle is a huge uh, privately owned company that specializes in recycling hard to recycle stuff. Those paper and bubble wrap envelopes that I was talking about, they are able to take the time and the money to separate those and recycle each stream separately. But doing this is expensive and costs more than the materials are worth. So how do they fill that gap? They fill it that gap through either brand sponsors or zero waste boxes. So the way the brand sponsors work, we've seen here in Kitsap County a year or so ago, REI and Subaru both were collecting uh, like K cups and coffee cups coffee lids and straws and snack wrappers. And they were doing that in partnership with TerraCycle. So their customers could come, deposit those items, and then it goes to, to, to TerraCycle where it gets warehoused until they find a buyer for the end product that these materials are going to be turning into. And then they hire a third party recycler who uh, separates and shreds and does all the processing so that the materials can be used. A zero, wa uh, a zero, a, um, zero waste box is something that you can privately purchase. Let's say that you are really upset with all of the coffee bags. You can't give up your coffee. You can't find a way from you a way away from using those bags, and you really don't want to throw them away. You can buy a coffee bag, TerraCycle zero waste box, 
and your postage is included in that. You fill that thing up, pop it in the mail, and it's um, it's it's wonderful, but it is expensive. And an 11 by 11 by 20 inch box is going to run you about $84. If you're doing more complicated recycling that is going to require more processing and more sorting and cleaning, those costs then go up. So TerraCycle is something I wanted you to know is a option out there. It's some other way that we can recycle outside of the normal four. So this resource page here was put together by Paul's Bow Rotary, the Trashy Task Force, to get these guides all put together in one place. So you can get your curbside recycling guide there, and you can get the Recycling Beyond the Bag from Trex Company. There are links to recycling events where you can be uh, kept up to date on things like the styrofoam recycling. There's one coming up for wheels and tires at the end of April and the first day of May. Um, so those links are all there. But the tool I really want to point out is that middle link in the page, what do I do with it? That is maintained by Kitsap County Department of Solid Waste. If you have posted your guides, as I hope you all will when this um, is over, and you still have questions, you can go to what do I do with it website, enter a search term and see what to do with that item. It tells you more than just curbside solutions. It will let you know of other opportunities and um, people or businesses who are collecting items as well. So it's a fabulous tool and it can really help prevent wish cycling by getting accurate information quickly. So a final thought before we go to Q&A for all of our panelists, the best way to recycle is to avoid bringing plastic into your home. Uh, Hans, Heather both talked about this. And one way to think about it is looking at how we can buy apples, for instance. We can choose to buy them in that plastic clamshell, or we can choose to buy them in a recyclable produce bag that can be recycled through tracks or through any grocery store bag take back. Or better yet, we can choose to buy them um, and put them in our own reusable containers. And with COVID, as COVID departs, we're gonna be able to do more and more of that. So when you're choosing, you're voting. You're voting with your wallet and you're sending a message to retailers because they listen to what people want to buy, when, not what they want to buy, what they actually buy. And so they will pay a lot of money to find out what consumers want and what they will purchase. So vote with your wallet, choose the items that have the least impact and that's one way that can, you can register your consumer demands and make uh, retailers demand from their manufacturers the kinds of things that we want to buy. So if there is no good choice, thank you, consumer electronics departments. You can ask for what it is you want. Um, do they have a, a packaging take back program? Do they know of a brand that has better and more environmentally friendly packaging that you can get? By asking, we can be heard. So my challenge to you is to keep your recycling pristine. I've always thought of recycling as landfill diversion, but really we need to use our landfill to keep our recycling very clean so that we do no harm. Remember our four rules, empty, clean, and dry, avoid wish cycling, print and post the guides where you will use them so you don't have to re remember them and so your head will not explode. And when in doubt, just throw it out. Don't agonize, save your energy and use it for some of the individual actions and legislative support that Heather and Hans have talked about. So, uh, I'd like to open this up to questions now. Uh, Robin, do we have any, any questions? There we go. 
Yes, we have several, as a matter of fact. Um, the first one was, what happens to the pill bottles that are turned in? Heather, would you like to take that? Because I do not know the answer. You know, it's, I'm glad someone asked that question because I was asking the same question myself. It turns out that the pill bottles generally are recyclable, but the problem is they're coming in such low quantities that it's hard for them to get them sorted um, correctly. So you have to look at jurisdiction by jurisdiction as to whether they can take them, but they are actually a recyclable item if they can get them in enough quantity. Very good, thank you. Okay. Let's see here, moving through. Um, this question, um, are the these minimum recycled content post consumer are these minimum recycled content post consumer content and should manufacturers have made the pledges but they say there's not enough plastic collected back to meet these minimum recycled requirements if so yes. why aren't they using just a, you know why aren't they supporting a bottle bill got it yes okay so that was three questions in one let me take them yes. one by one so the recycled um, minimum uh, requirements are for post-consumer. That means after you have used it, um, not the scrapings from the bottom of the, the factory floor, which is called post-industrial. So this is post-consumer where you have taken it, it's gone into your blue bin and gone to a facility like Lori just described. The, um, the uh, what was the second question there? Um, the manufacturers have oh, made pledges. The manufacturer, okay, so the manufacturers, major brands um, like Coca-Cola and Unilever and um, Procter and Gamble, um, they own a lot of other brands. So the major corporations behind the scenes have made these pledges. They've said they're going to get to twenty five percent by twenty fifty. They said they they're going to get to fifty percent by such and such a date. So what we're doing is we're putting into law what the the pledges that they have made. And we did have a lot of negotiation, a ton of negotiation with them through the development of the bill. And they um, said, yes, those are stretch goals, but they're achievable. So 2031, 50% by 2031, they're saying, they said, yep, we can do it. So we don't expect a lot of lawsuits and pushback. The other thing is, which I hate to say, but they know it, is we have substantial off ramps in the bill that will protect them. Um, if there is not enough supply available at that time of clean resin, clean recycled resin to make new bottles or jugs out of, they will not, ha they will not have to be in compliance at that point. Um, that was painful, but the reality is we were, this is the first bill in the country to do personal care products and cleaning products um, and California, as you know, is what, five times our population size or more. They're, 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 so there, there is going to be, there already is a supply issue, but our goal with the, with the bill next year, the omnibus bill that I mentioned, is to really work hard to get that clean feedstock. Basically what Lori just said was right on. We need clean feedstock so we can actually recycle into new materials. Now, we really want to have less of it in the first place. So just to hammer that message, we want to not have it. In the first. Don't get a water bottle, bring your own. But if you are going to recycle, make sure it's clean because we need the clean feedstock and that's and that we need to clean up our recycling system. Did I get all three questions answered? I believe so. Yes. Um, next one. Um, when we have products that, are, that contain the recycled materials, how many more times can it be uh, recycled again? You want to do that, Laura? You want me to do it? I don't know that one either. Okay, okay. Let's have you do All right, that. So let's start with metal. Um, so aluminum cans can be made into new cans, no problem. It's just energy. And by the way, the energy is a lot less than if you are creating a brand new can, can from, from the ore. So metal can go to metal without any degradation. Glass can go to glass without any degradation. But when you go paper to paper or plastic to plastic, you do shorten the length. So in paper, the long fibers become shorter and shorter over time. And you do need to add um, some virgin in there to virgin material in there to be able to make the high grade papers. That's why they go to lower and lower grade papers as they recycle, which is great because they're reusing and then ultimately hopefully is going to compost, going back into the soil. The plastic is the same thing. So um, as you recycle it, you're heating it up and you're degrading the polymers and they do they they need to be a certain length for the different uh, properties that they have and the different types that they are. So there is a need most of the time, not entirely, to add virgin material. 
PET, which is the number one plastic jug, plastic bottles, no, the number one in your recycling system, that actually is the easiest to take to a new plastic bottle or a fiber without having to do a, the, the virgin in there as much. So it does depend on the plastic, but it, there is degradation that occurs as you go through the recycling process. Okay, this is a little different um, question. Uh, in Suquamish, they are going to be doing a community trash uh, cleanup, and they want uh, to know how they can link up with the litter analysis project that you discussed earlier. Cool. Okay, well, please email me afterwards, and I'll put my email in the chat. Um, we would love to support groups who want to do that. So I will go ahead and put my email into the chat right now. That would be awesome. Yes. Um, Here's a question from Anne. Um, she wonders if any of the speakers could give a few examples of things that they do in their own lives to help cut down on their plastic pollution or plastic use. Well, Lori, why don't you go first? <laughs> okay. Well, one of my favorite um, switches has been getting rid of my laundry detergent jugs and switching to a, uh, I just get it in the mail. It's in a recyclable uh, paper envelope and there is no, uh, there's no plastic involved whatsoever. I saw that somebody had submitted that um, in our chat. I, I'm using, um, I can't remember my brand, but there are several. I found the one that costs the least and it does a great job on my clothes. So I think it's called Earth True. It starts with, the, with Earth. So that is one way. The other way, of course, was finding a way to build the habit that I would have my reusable bags with me when I actually went to the store. I had more trouble teaching myself to acquire that habit. I tried different ways. And finally, I found that I needed to put them not in my trunk, but in the passenger side of my car. Uh, I needed to put them over my purse. And that way, there was no way I could leave without my bags. So it's an example of how when we want to change a, a habit, just stopping, paying attention to it, coming up with different solutions and choosing the best of those solutions is something we're all going to have to do and we're fully capable of doing it. Sometimes it's just a matter of paying attention. Heather, do you have any cool? I, I, I could add other examples, but the main thing I'll say is that I have a toxics background. So I am like really not happy with plastic from the point of view of the migration of the toxic chemicals in plastic into your food and beverage. So as much as possible, I try to avoid, and we all try to avoid, um, I said family, friends, everyone, you all, um, using um, things where you have plastic in contact with food, especially hot food, especially hot, greasy food. Don't ever microwave in plastic and try to shift everything to um, inert things like metal and like um, glass and ceramic. So for example, I don't know if you can see it, but this is my water thermos and my glass straw. So no plastic here. And this is, you know, um, insulated. Um, I love this, by the way. I'm not going to necessarily be a brand or whatever, but it's a, it's a wonderful um, double hold metal um, thing that I use with ice water every day. So as much as you can get plastic out of anything that you have with um, food or beverage content, or if you bring it home from the grocery store, try to transfer it quickly into um, something like a ceramic or glass so that it will, um, when you're storing it in your, in your fridge, to the extent that you can, obviously, not everything. I so think one of our listeners has um, to, uh, posted that UPS reuses bubble wrap and air pillows. So there's another place to uh, reduce a little bit in the stream. Um, can you recycle the hard clear plastic containers that things like eggs and apples often come in? So those are called thermoforms. I think that, that that may be that. So it's the clear, like what strawberries come in, um, the, the clear um, hinge things. Is that, I yeah. think that might, might be what that person's referring to. Do you think that is, Lori? It sounds like it. Okay, so those are called thermoforms um, and they are mostly made out of PET plastic. So yes, in theory, they are recyclable. And I was just on a thing this morning, a meeting this morning from California they were discussing this very topic. So as I mentioned, PET bottles and jugs are very, very recyclable and have really maintained all the way through the crisis. The thermoforms, the processors can only take up to 10% of those thermoforms in a bale, and then they start to have problems at their, at their processing facility. But in California, there are now 
three facilities that are designed only to recycle thermoform plastic um, containers. And this is awesome because what this means is, is that um, over time, those will be, um, probably will have that up here in Washington. Now, again, main message though is don't get the plastic in the first place, but if you're gonna get it, you want it to really be recycled. And this would be a way for that to actually happen with the thermoforms. That's exciting because I've been collecting um, thermoform and basic clamshell packaging in order to build an interactive children's plastic clamshell cavern of doom um, because we're not there yet. So really try to avoid those clamshells. We need to send a message to our retailers that yes, they're stackable. Yes, they protect the foods. That's why they're so ubiquitous in the first place. We've got to vote with our wallets and not buy those things. Right. So for example, um, and by the way, Diane is right. Diane put a chat in. They're not allowed. They, they don't want them, but I'm saying they can tolerate up to 10% in the bales, the processors, but they don't want them. Um, so um, they have this new uh, strawberry packaging in California that I've seen that it's made out of paper. So it's fully compostable and it's even got less material in it, got a little more air in it. Um, so instead of those little plastic baskets or a plastic clamshell, they have a paper version, which we need our grocery stores here to use. Well, that sounds like something we should be asking for. Yeah, it does. Let's see. Um, where did I just see this one? Uh, Jessica from Vashon says they have styrofoam recycling once a month there and more products are being added all the time. Good information, but that would be King County, so a little bit different. Can I interrupt? I saw one question about that, um, about address labels on plastic bags yes. that are paper and also foil lined juice boxes. How about recycling those? Unless you were to pay for it through something like TerraCycle, they're so mixed that they are a, they're a contaminant and they would need to be landfilled anyway. So the issue with um, anything where it's mixed material, paper on plastic, is that just is a nightmare for them. Um, you're, you're basically doing contamination. So if you have, for example, a paper envelope and it has a plastic window in it, take rip the plastic envelope out, put that in the garbage and put the envelope in your recycle. One um, place where you don't have to worry about the labels I found out from uh, Trex is on those digital um, mailers like uh, Amazon Prime, it's okay to leave those paper labels on. I was amazed because I sp had spent a lot of time removing them. They or have some tolerance. Trex Lumber does have some tolerance for, for contamination, a little bit of tolerance. Yeah. Um, here's one. Uh, the, the, um, I think Costco is one of the worst offenders with the clamshells. Have you ever appealed to them about maybe recycling some of those things or avoiding them in the first place? So um, there's an effort in Snohomish County, uh, a community group that has basically got a campaign to ask Costco to use less packaging. So um, you could do a campaign here, I mean, Kitsap as well. Um, so they are sensitive to public pressure and it doesn't take a lot to get companies to change. Now in defense of Costco, um, to some, not, not full, but partial defense of Costco, they actually have made some major, major strides in reducing packaging. So for example, they took the milk jugs and they made them rectangular and they were able to put a ton more of them per pallet saving truck um, space and being able to basically reduce the amount of packaging they used overall. They also took their peanut butter jars and instead of them being round, they made them square with a round lid. So it convert, it goes, it transitions from, from, from flat square to round. And that was able, they were then able to put a ton more per pallet. So get ton more per um, truck and do less packaging. Um, they also, those, um, those uh, big um, pallet things. Um, and they have like this, um, paper, cardboardy thing around it. They made those into things that could be displays. So they, this is about like eight years ago, a long time ago, they did a huge effort to go over everything they could think of at the time and make changes. Now I think maybe it's time for another one of those rounds and, and public pressure on them could be very, very helpful. So we're gonna go back to those pill bottles. Um, the clarification in the, it, this was the pill bottles that go into the medication take back are, 
they incinerated with the medication or are they? Okay, great. Okay, so on the take back drug take back program, which I mentioned, which you all should completely take advantage of, it started in November. Um, they, you can take the medi your medication and put it in these blue kiosks that kind of look like a mailing box, a, mail a post box. They do allow you to put everything in there, including the packet, the packaging, so the boxes or the um, the pill boxes and things like that. Our recommendation is that you take your pills out and just put them into um, either put them in there loose or put them into a Ziploc and put them in, you know, basically don't put the packaging in because yes, everything is being incinerated, which we hate. Mm -hmm. It's going to a very high temperature incinerator um, in another state. And we, when we, when the legislation was passed, that was a huge, huge debate. But the problem is, is that right now the FD, the, um, the drug, um, the drug, the drug agency, is it, I don't think it's FDA, but the one that worries about the drug in terms of drug crime, they require that it be incinerated. Um, and so, the, and they're not allowed, the people who are transporting it are not allowed to go through and pick things up again, because of drug security. So um, they do let you put the packaging in, but I always tell people privately, just don't do it. Just put in the pills and, and, and do whatever you want to do with the other, the other things, recycle it, or if it has to be landfill, landfill it. But um, yeah, it's getting incinerated if you put it in that blue box for these federal law rules. For See. now, for now, we want that change in the future. Um. Here's another good question. Why don't companies support the bottle bill if they need post-consumer feed stock? Well, they have completely metamorphosed. So, um, you know, a few years ago, we'd bring up a bottle bill and it was just like, oh, no, bad idea. Bad. This is before China National Sword and all the other things about plastics. Um, there were laws that the beverage industry and others had a big, huge campaign across the country to pass laws to forbid a state from being able to even do a bottle bill. That has now metamorphosed, meta, whatever, evolved, so that now we are in a situation where the beverage industry really does want the material, and they are um, saying that you know one of the solutions are bottle deposit schemes. So Portland, or I mean, sorry, not not Portland, Oregon to our south has the best bottle bill bottle program in the in the US. They have over a 95% return rate of the bottles um, in their system. They they upped it to 10 cents deposit recently. They have a phenomenal if you ever they have online videos. It's amazing how good their program is. And so we are envious of them. And so we'll see what happens in the next few years with our big omnibus bill and what that component might be because it really is um, a way to get the material clean and um, good quality stuff. Let's see here. Here's one, one more. I heard um, somebody had heard that glass bottles couldn't be accepted in the recycling cans because they would break. How can they then be recycled? And is okay, this so that's what you remember. I showed a photo of the truck coming around and they crush everything by 30% they are splintering the glass when they do that. And then when it gets to the recycling facility, they dump it and it gets even more splintered. So it's getting broken, broken, broken. And it goes into these, and, and what happens is you get these teeny little shards. The little shards go in, then get caught on everything, you know, from electrostatic. So for example, on the paper, and then when it goes to the paper, the paper bales go to the pulp and paper mill, it acts like sandpaper on their metal recycling equipment down there, uh, their, their, their processing equipment. So no one wants the glass in the recycling system from the point of view of the operations. But of course the consumers want to recycle their glass. And so there's this huge push me pull you going on about whether we do or don't have glass in is what they kind of frame it as. Is glass in or is glass, glass out? Um, so Tacoma is glass out, Bellingham is glass out. I don't know what Kitsap is. It may be variable across the region. Glass in, we glass are glass in, in totally. Seattle's glass yeah. in, Most, many places are glass in. We, as an organization, are advocating that it be glass out and that what the way you do it is because the, the industry says, oh no, oh no, you can't do that because it would require more trucks and more labor and more this and more that. And the, the way to do it would be to alternate weeks. So one week, so you would still have the same truck number and the same truck trips and the same worker number, but you would have at your home two bins, one that would be containers and one that would be paper. 
and paper stuff. And so one week you would put out your paper or whatever bin, let's say that's the yellow bin. And the next week you'd put out your blue bin, which would be the other stuff. Same trucks, they would just alternate what they do each week. And um, it would generally be more or less the same quantity of material that you're putting out week to week. Um, I don't know the specifics on that. We would like to see that piloted around here because we really want to go back to that, what would you would call dual stream recycling instead of commingled, which has caused this huge nightmare. Um, not only is it the glass getting all over everything else, but you have other things getting all over everything else. You get you have the liquid from the bottles getting all over the paper. And when once the paper's wet, it becomes not usable to recycle, et cetera. So getting some separation back in Japan, they have 24 or 28 different bins. What are we doing here? I, I wish I had an answer. <laughs> Here's another announcement. There's a beach cleanup Saturday at 10 in Indianola because, so if you're um, probably some other locations too. And let's see here, let's, um, one last one. I think this is probably Lori's bailiwick. Are frozen vegetable and fish bags and cereal liner bags recyclable with plastic bags? And how about plastic film that wraps food? Those are great questions. And if I went, I really wish I had my guide right in front of me because it is, my head explodes trying to remember all the do's and don'ts and that guide just makes it so clear. So frozen food bags are not on the guide. And the reason is because they have additives in there to help keep things fresh that they don't want at treks. Um, things that wrap or touch uh, meat or fish, they don't want. That is also has additives and it's also con it's contaminated. And the cereal liners are actually on the guide. It, if it's odd, you wouldn't expect it because generally the rule with these kind of films is if you can stretch it with your thumb, it's probably the polyethylene that they want. But if it's crackly and crunchy and you can't stretch it, <clears throat> it's probably something else. Cereal box liners are the exception. They chemically work, and so it's on the guide, and yes, we can do it. And you know, I just want to clarify one thing about printing and posting the guides. When I say to do that, I don't mean to think you're going to do it and then don't do it. What I'm really trying to say is make it a priority. Make it something that you do so you can recycle right easily. If you're busy, put it on your calendar and schedule it like an important meeting to go in, print the guides and get them posted where you can use them. Because it is hard in this country to recycle right. It's not made easy for us. There are all kinds of blends of plastics. We never know what is the chemistry of what's in our house. So use the guides so your head doesn't explode. It's my health message. Okay, um, let's see, there's one last one. Are yogurt cups considered dairy cartons? I'll be happy to take that one because that one terrorized me. I'm looking at the guide, I'm looking at my little yogurt cup and I'm standing there scratching my head going, is this a cup? Cups aren't recyclable or is this a round dairy tub, which is on the list? So what I did is I went to Kitsap County's what do I do with it site? And it clearly said, yogurt cups are fine. So now I just um, rinse them, dry them, and throw them in my bin. Let's see, three, terrific. All right, I think we have answered all of the questions, or at least a good percentage of them. Um, ladies, I, would, I just wanna thank you for your time and all the fabulous information that you have presented with, uh, um, with presented us today along with the shippers who have obviously had to go back to work, but they're in Hawaii, so we only feel so bad for them. Uh, but honestly, this is so informative. Thank you so very much. We, we do appreciate it. And thank you and thank you to everyone who's doing all your great things you're doing out there. <laughs> and special thanks to the league and to Olympic College for hosting this fabulous forum. Thank you, everyone. Could I just make one last plug for some Earth Week events coming up still? In case, you haven't, in case you haven't had enough um, you know, mind-blowing information and experiences about Earth Day, um, let's, let's do a little bit more. Um, so uh, here is a slide. Can you see my screen here? Yes. 
Yes, uh, just showing the remaining events that we have going on this week. Uh, there will be um, an online event tomorrow at noon talking about what Olympic College is doing around sustainability. And then we have a wetland walk um, tomorrow at two o'clock at Illahee Preserve. And all of these um, can be found on the Olympic College website. Uh, if you just Google Earth Week at OC, you'll find it. Uh, and then uh, on Friday, the 23rd, we have a sunrise bird walk at Wig Tree Trail, which is at the Rhododendron Preserve uh, near, on the way to Seabeck, if any of you are familiar with that, um, as well as another work party. So thank you for um, allowing me to share those with you. And thank you to everyone for being here tonight. Any last words? I, I would just like to say, uh, Robin, are you closing? Do you have no? Go right ahead, Lori. I was just going to close with um, with remembering some of those slides we've seen of plastic covered beaches, and I'm just thinking that we don't want that, and we need to act like it. And so I urge you all to vote with your wallet, vote with your ballot, recycle right, and let's be part of the solution. Thank you. All right, I believe that concludes our presentation for this evening. Thank you so much, all Bye of everybody. you. Good night. <laughs>